Hi, I'm Rainer from the Flipper and Arcade Museum Sedlingstadt and from the Forum Isn't Only in Germany. And now you are listening to Scene World Podcast. It's this thing. I'm me. He's over there. How you doing? Good. Good. Very happy about this interview because we will learn a lot and your listeners will learn a lot too about computer history. But more about that later. Let's yeah. start with the news. Yes. It, so, so okay. I will let, let you, I'll let you start. What have you got? Well, Christian Kleinzer actually released a limited edition of 30 units of frogs, his latest four-player C64 game. Mm -hmm. And actually, I was the one getting the last of the 30 units. So it's on a green diskette. Okay. It's, it's officially developed to work on NTSC. Because uh, AJ and I, we had this discussion mm -hmm. recently where he said that the first four-player adapter games like Bomb Media weren't NTSC fixed. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yes, that's true, but newer games actually are NTSC fixed, and Frog is one of them. But you can still get a normal edition of Frogs, of course. Yes. And um, more details about that on the Facebook page of Dr. Ruo. That's W-U-R-O, because his label is called Dr. Ruro Industries. Okay. And um, also on his homepage that we'll put in the links description, as always. Yes. What kind of disc? He said it's a green disc. I had a... I, I used to have a, a set of uh, Fuji discs back in... Oh, God knows when long ago. They, they came in different colors, but God, they were the worst discs ever. <laughs> Good question. I didn't open the box yet. Oh. Maybe I should. Maybe you should do an unboxing video. <laughs> Maybe I should. All right, let's see. For player Fog Pond. That's interesting. Yeah. Does it say a brand? No, it doesn't. Ooh. Mm. So no name. Well, of course, normally you wouldn't you wouldn't get games with the original no, sticker on it. No, it, you, normally it would be removed. I just remember getting those. I think I got them at like a Ben Franklin craft store years and years and years ago. And every box that I got, maybe maybe half the discs worked, and the rest were just crap. And none of them have survived to the present day. And I've still got a ton of discs that did survive to now. So I mean, wow, yeah. So those were just not not great discs. But these could very well be much better. Nicer manufactured discs. So I don't want to pass judgment on them. I've got two pieces of news here. Actually, well, I got one other news oh, about okay. release, if I may. Absolutely. Um, there is also um, a collection release of Flunkle's Boulder Dash. Mm -hmm. We had a Boulder Dash special issue a while ago, yep. and I actually got a disc on it. It's a compilation of all the prior Boulder Dash releases he did. Okay. And so we will also put that in the description. Cool. Yup, yup, yup. So. Right. Yeah, so right. I've got. So what have you got? I got two pieces of news here that have to do with the same thing. Um, video games. Well, no. Uh, last, it, it's the the again the ZX Spectrum next that we talked about in the news last week and maybe the week before that. Um, the the campaign has come to an end, and they have raised uh, seven hundred and twenty three thousand pounds, or or just shy of a million dollars. Wow, okay. so that's a lot. Yeah, so that thing is way it's funded way beyond its its uh, original um goals 
And apparently backers are supposed to get this thing in August, which is only a couple of months away at this point. So that's kind of a tight schedule for really putting that together. Um, but even more interesting than that is that the, the, the team behind the ZX Spectrum Next has announced um, that, and this is according to Vintage is the New Old, um, the machine already has three AY audio chips, which is what the original uh, ZX Spectrum had. It had one of them, uh, but this has three. Um, they sent out a backers-only update that now that they reached a certain goal, they'll be adding a SID chip to it, making it capable of playing SID music. Which is interesting because there have been numerous announcements that there will be new SID chips. And so far, we had this in a few um, podcasts earlier, so far only the SWIN SID actually materialized. Yes. So I, I saw the report to the news item on Winter is the New Old, and um, they actually discussed on, on Facebook and stuff if it's actually a real ship, yeah. if it's an FPGA, mm -hmm. or if it's an emulated ship, or is it one without filters like in the DTV. So nobody knows yet. But um, we also had an interview with Jens Schoenfeld for the Commodore uh, Mark II, where he also said he's working on something regarding the SID chip. Yeah. So this will be very surprising because uh, and promising because in the last 43 years, nobody actually made a working clone of the uh, 6581 because of this analog filter, right? Warm characteristics, right? Sound right. thing. Oh, well, my my concern, and and I hope it isn't that sort of thing. Is if they do use. Um, original, actual SIDs that it's not we're not going to have like this, this kind of chip pulling industry like we used to have with you know when the uh, the SID station and all those other things they were making where they had whole companies whose only function was to take C sixty fours, yank the SID out, and toss the rest of the machine. That's a that's a real shame to do that, and I, I'm hoping that they either source them from places where they're not wasting the rest of the thing or or that it is a you know a swin sid or some other yeah why FBGA. not working together with the guys from hungary why not i just know? have a feeling it would be easier to just you know buy some online or or you know yank them out of some broken or you know some even working machines and just throw them in that way you know i i, I think that's the easier option but it's the less attractive option to me anyway uh, why not supporting the scene and making a deal with the Swinset guys, you yeah. know? Yeah, absolutely. It sounds pretty good. It sounds pretty decent. Mm -hmm. Everybody will be happy, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, also, this is the reason why the um, why the once fully fully sold with chips was uh, limited by Jens Schoenfeld. When he did his first C64 Reloaded, he, he he sold the boards with new old stock ships, so yes. not being pulled from working or broken C64 boards. Right. So I think if you listen to this, guys, from the Spectrum project, cooperate with the Swinzit guys. That yeah. would be a good option. Or make a new ship, but yeah. then you will be not the... You will be not the the only one because Jens Schoenfeld also it seems to work on something. Yeah. So it will be it will be a very very good surprise and very interesting because in the last twenty years I've heard a lot of people saying I will make a clone of the sixty five eighty one and you know, it materialize. I, I don't think that it would even be possible to make a clone of the sixty five just because of the way it was made. I mean, if you if somehow we could reverse engineer the manufacturing process to go back to to making it the way that it was originally made, then you could probably get something that was, you know, recreate the original thing the way it was originally done. But to make something with an FPGA, you're, you're never going to make it 100% accurate just because of the fact that with even within SIDs, one SID didn't sound the same as the other SID. And they could have been made a month apart and they sound different because... Just because of the fact that they were, you know, so, you know, have part analog, part digital, and just, you know, the way that they were kind of put together, 
I don't think that they ever will that no one will ever be successful in recreating them a hundred percent but you know I mean the 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 number of them is disappearing is or mm. not disappearing but it's it's dwind- diminishing so it would be nice to have something where we could have a a reasonable facsimile okay okay so you just you... So you just just mentioned yeah, just one piece the, of news. Did the What's ZX, the other one? I did the, the two ZX, the, the Specky news is there. Um, so generation, I got another one here. Uh, generation Amiga reports that um, that Belgian Hyperion Entertainment, who is the one that um, behind the Amiga One and Amiga OS, um, and the Italian company Cloanto, are currently in a battle royale. Over the remaining Amiga IPs, um, apparently Hyperion's patents were rejected by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, who found that they were too similar to Cloanto's Amiga trademarks, which would be um, Amiga Forever and stuff like that. Um, so this is just more, more Amiga trademark saga nonsense. You know, with having everything split between every different twenty-five different companies. Um, also, on the Amiga front, uh, so there was a, a an open source accelerator board being developed by this guy Stephen Leary. Uh, it was uh, called the Terrible Fire. It was an o uh, sixty-eight o twenty accelerator board that would work in any uh, Amiga five hundred, and would all could also work in Atari systems. Um, it was available under the GPL V2 license. He was also working on the TF540, which was a 68040 accelerator, and I don't know which, which Amiga that was for, but it was just an accelerator for the Amigas. But um, he has canceled both of these projects um, because he has received um, a lot of criticism from the, the Amiga scene regarding them, which is seems to be a common theme lately criticism from from the scene and then people canceling their projects because of that yeah it, so it seems to be kind of a a, a theme lately the, the, the scene can be freaking brutal man and people just are full of criticism and that would you know well these both of these boards were evident, evidently available under the gpl license so being open source, maybe someone else can kind of pick up on them and and carry on if he's uh, if he's going to cancel them, and we'll put a link to the the sort the uh, the Generation Amiga um, story for that and the other one down below, so you can read them and watch the video associated with it. Yeah, so this is what you call a fork. A what? A fork. A fork. Yes. Okay, that's not what I. Because thought. you that's are not you what are, I thought you said for a second. <laughs> because you are you you are continuing an approach on a project, but you are making your own branch, right? And go well, in a if, different direction. If somebody like Reaper, like Libre Office is a fork of Open Office. Yeah. Well, if if someone picks it up and continues with it, that would be a fork of it. Because I guess this guy was was you know exactly. designed these things, so that would be. Mm-hmm. It'd be, it's a shame to see it because I, I'm just kind of I'm getting I'm just getting into the Amiga. I just got my my 500 here, and I've got my uh, my ACA 500 plus from uh, from individual computers. And I, you know, I'll tell you, they uh, you can overclock it to 42 megahertz, and but n- none of that is guaranteed because you know it's a 68,000. It's not really supposed to go over, you know, 14. But this thing has been rock solid at every speed I've thrown it at it, and I, you know, it's it's this thing flies at with a forty-two megahertz, sixty-eight thousand. Man, this thing is is bitching. So I can only imagine what you know, like an O two O or an O forty accelerator would would do to an A five hundred. Well, I still think somebody should pick up and make new super CPUs. Yeah, that could be. See, there was such a. 
there there was such a, a slim market for that even when they were new though i mean how many were even sold all of them well yeah but i mean that's all of them but if you made six that, that's not you can still sell all of them and it's not a huge demand i mean i see them online well, now there now there is a huge demand <laughs> well is is there though i see them online on ebay for ludicrous amounts of money but i know i don't see much i mean from on a day-to-day basis if if you've got a c64 and if you're in the in the 90s in the in towards the end of when the c64 was relevant as a daily computer i i can understand the the super cpu because it it gave you that extra life that you needed if you needed to use if you wanted to use geos if you wanted to keep using it as your main as your main device the super cpu came in handy because it gave you extra memory i did that yeah. i did that i used it for geos i used it for test drive i still use it for test drive nowadays right, right. because it's it's great right but but at this point today you know i i feel like the applications for it are are fewer because of the fact that uh, most people using the machine are using are coding for the stock machine if you're making a demo or a new game it's going to be for the stock thing there's you know what is that metal dust i think that was made mm-hmm. for the super cp metal dust yes i i think that um i would really think that something more like the Turbo Chameleon would be more beneficial because it gives you more more modern options. It, I don't think it's as fast as the Super CPU, but it gives you some extra some extra things that the Super CPU wasn't up for at the time because things like things like HDMI, you know, video didn't exist in 1988 or whenever it is that they developed the Super CPU. No, it was um, nineteen ninety-seven. Ninety-seven? That's that was that late. Ninety-seven. Yep. Wow. Wow. You sure about that? Yes, I bought one ninety-eight. Well, I know, I know what they were available then, but but I I feel like they were made. No. Late nineties. Seriously. Oh yeah, you're right. It was released May nineteen ninety-seven. Huh. Yeah. Well, how you do? How you know that? Exactly, exactly twenty years ago. Yeah. Well, either either way, I still I still feel like. Um... I tell you what I tell you I tell you what broke the neck of the Super CPU. There were a lot of projects announced for the Super CPU that never really re, never really materialized. Right. There was this project by by um, a British a British. A magazine that they would do- donate a whole lot of money to the person who does Doom for the Super CPU. <laughs> he took the money, he didn't develop the game. Yeah. What else? There was um, there were other things being planned for for RAM expansion. Also something that the Super CPU has because of the Super RAM card. Mm-hmm. That's 16 megabytes. There was this this um, Pinball Illusions, I think it's called, on the Amiga. Yeah. And this is the 64 version developed since 2004. 2004. And it was supposed to need a RAM extension. Even the demo that you can download from CSDB mm-hmm. needs a RAM extension, but it was never finished. Right. So just two examples of projects that were done and and would have used a super CPU in a good way, but never finished. So it's not like there was no interest. It was just people being involved in the projects, never finishing them. Right. And that's that's and that's really a shame. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, like like the Worms clone called Crops, never yeah. never finished. It was right. just a preview. Right. Well, it, it, uh, you know, and it, it was partially. I I feel like, you know, I I thought that it had come out earlier than ninety seven, but then that just sort of. Um, no, that was the Flash Eight card. Right, right. But you know, that but that, was, but that again, earlier. that again, you know, when you release it that late in in the C sixty four's lifespan. 
again, you know, if it had come out earlier, maybe it could have taken off better because, you know, you would have had kind of more time to build a user base um, and, 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 a, and a software base because the C64 was still really popular. And, and, and whereas doing it at the end of the 90s, really, I mean, that was kind of the the last hurrah of the of the C64 there wasn't much wasn't much after that so i think that we could make i think that somebody like individual computers like jens uh schoenfeld could really build something with modern components that would be just as good if not better than the super cpu and give us some options that that thing couldn't do because and again the the the, the super or the 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 Turbo Chameleon comes to mind, even though that's not quite the same thing. You know, it's faster. It gives you that HDMI video. It gives you, you know, a lot of options that I, that I think would make it more of a valuable thing than a than a super CPU. The, right now, you know, the the vast majority of super CPU people that I know use it to run a BBS because that's where that's where it's useful. You know, it's useful in 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 running that because it can. You know, keep up with the high baud rates. It can keep up, keep all the files in memory, and not have to worry about pulling them off of a disk. You know, all that. That's where I see it the most useful right now, and not just as a general general purpose. You know, accelerator. Plus, the C sixty four didn't have a lot of things. You know, and I'm and I'm discovering with with like the Amiga because I've got this thing in here running at forty two megahertz, and Amiga software really doesn't doesn't mind. You know, it's you, you. Most software runs perfectly fine with it. You know, at that higher speed, it doesn't really care what. If some some does, some will let you know. You know, this isn't going to run right. But most just they'll make use of it, or or it won't. It'll ignore it completely. Whereas with the C sixty four, when you ran a lot of software, uh, in with the super CPU engaged, it was violently fast. Like it was un unplayably fast. That's true. Yeah. So I think that there has to be a way to kind of, I I don't know I don't I don't see that it would be really even a viable even if they made it now it wouldn't be that viable thing, aside from people that that would need the power for again you know people that run BBSs on it or or people geos. that yeah geos but who uses geos for you know daily use anymore I don't I don't know anyone. I did back in the day yeah you did back in the day but but when it when it came when my C sixty four was nearing the end of its if the end of its usefulness and and i wanted to use geos for stuff my upgrade came in the form of a 128 a 128 with with a with a 1581 and a uh and a ram expansion and you've got and, and that's the perfect geos machine hmm. and finally i the last piece of news i have is that G give it give it to us <laughs> <laughs> okay so the trailer has dropped for the movie it came from the desert. Um, yeah, so the the trailer is out. Um, Give it to me. Yeah, I I will. I'll send you the link, and we'll put a, post a link to this in the podcast description. Um, it looks it looks like everything you would hope the trailer from It Came from the Desert to look like. Just like just like in the Amiga game. Yes, exactly like what you would expect. Well, Cinema Retro is involved in it, right? Well, yeah, yeah. They got the license from Cinema Retro. Yeah. Well, it does look so cheesy, actually. It looks like every. I think, I, I, I think it looks pretty good. Yeah, it looks like everything that I would hope the the it came from the desert movie would look like, which is that that kind of that 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 that, that B horror movie, you know, nineteen fifties giant ant sort of thing but you know obviously modernized and you know that's that's cool i i'd i'd watch it i'd go see it uh, is it gonna be in theaters i don't know if it's gonna be in theaters no idea probably right, yeah probably not but but yeah i i'd, I'd totally watch that that looks it looks fun <laughs> you got anything else no well then Let's get to the fun part. So we are talking with Eve Bolomini from the Bolo Museum in uh, in Switzerland. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So you are actually a founder of 
the Musée, uh, I guess, Bolli or something, how you call Bolo. it? Bolo, Bolo Museum. Bolo, Bolo is a short name for my last name. Oh, yeah, I guess so. Okay. And, um, and it, I guess it was founded like in 2002? Yes, the museum itself. Actually, I'm, <clears throat> I'm the founder, but I'm also the first collector first computer collector behind the museum. I started in 1995 to collect computers. Okay, so why don't we, we uh, give the listeners who might not know about the museum a kind of a rundown of, of what it is that, that you display there and, and what the content of the, of the exhibits are. For the start of the museum was my, my collection. I started in 1995, and the museum itself was uh, created in 2002. And the first first museum was the uh, first exhibit was actually um, a more technical uh, exhibit, you know, uh, <clears throat> an evolution of the te technology, and it was f mainly for students of the school we are in. And um, then we created an, a foundation in 2007, and the goal of this foundation was to. Um, to talk to a uh, broader public and to um, explain more the history of uh, digital and not only the history of technology, you know. And also <clears throat> what is interesting between uh, the link between the human and the machine uh, and the society and the machine. And so that's what we want to show now. And the new exhibit uh, was um, uh, created in 2011, and uh, its name is uh, Programmed Disappearance. And the idea was to explain that computer was disappearing, but of course it's everywhere, but it's disappearing, be disappearing because it's getting smaller and smaller, for instance, or it's hiding in the objects, and so it's disappearing from, from the site. And so the the goal was to have, you know, quite um, a fun experience and to uh, to explain something about the history of technology, but uh, in a you know a fun context for the broader public. Mm. Interestingly, you said you started '95, but isn't that kind of late for a computer museum to start collecting computers '95? <laughs> where, where most people started in the 80s, actually. Yeah, maybe. Uh, actually, I, I was a student uh, at EPFL, so this uh, Polytechnical School in Lausanne, and uh, I was a collector of uh, tons of things. <laughs> and uh, I found uh, an Apple II in, in the street, actually, in the garbage. And so I, I took this Apple II, and I, at this time, I didn't know about all, all this uh, history. And I, I was... Uh, uh, still uh, young, you know, <laughs> and so uh, I started with computers in uh, 88, and my first computer was an Amiga 2000, and um, yeah, Amiga, okay. <laughs> not Atari, Amiga, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, got one right here, Amiga, Amiga, Amiga Atari War, <laughs> and um, in uh, 88, so that's in 88 that I, I, that I uh, found out about computers, actually. There is more and more computing power around us constantly, and we notice it less and less because it's little things like our phones or or our TVs or something. So, our so how watches. does yeah, exactly? Yeah, your, your watches. Yeah. So how does no, this? Watch. How does the exhibit? You know, take on that. How does? How do we? How do we see that in this? So um, the, the exhibit now is uh, in a place uh, at the, at the school. So it, it's not so big, but it's okay. And um, we have a, like a, a big corridor, and we have a, a wall on it. In it, we, we built this wall. It's uh, 21 meters long, so it's quite long. And um, the, the the idea was to to display that like um, um, it's like a police investigation. Okay. And we have um, in the, on the wall we have a mind map, and with the um, uh, five leads for this uh, investigation. And for instance, the first uh, lead is uh, reduction. So it's getting smaller and smaller. That's the why it is disappearing. Um, the second lead is uh, a camouflage. It is uh, hiding in the objects. And all these leads uh, 
it's a way to explain the disappearance of the computer. And so it's a bit like a game, you know. You can find uh, uh, clues of the investigation. Uh, there are witnesses, and witnesses are uh, important people in the history of computing. And that, that, yeah, it, it can be seen a bit like a game uh, to 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 go and visit this uh, this exhibit. For example, like Chuck Paddle, who did the first low cost. CPU. Yes, Chuck Pedal is not in the uh, the exhibit, but uh, we could uh, we could have uh, um, include him. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. For instance, uh, we have yes yeah, so for um, of course Gordon Moore for the you know getting smaller and smaller on the microprocessors, and um, also one lead is uh, the humanization of the computer. It is uh, disappearing because it is becoming a human and human becoming a computer. We don't exactly. And so um, um, <clears throat> one witness is uh, Douglas Engelbart because he's humanizing a bit the computer with the mouse, all this kind of stuff. Hmm. Interesting. So, um, yeah, I guess it's it's quite an interesting concept. It's um, so so in your museum. It's also like that you can touch the computers and interact with the with the stuff that is exhibited, because uh, for example here in Germany you often have museums where everything is a, a, um, behind you know glass, and you cannot touch it, or or the computers don't even work. <laughs> yes, actually uh, our problem with this uh, this location is that it is uh, open. It is not like a museum with a, a key and a, uh, some guide or some, uh, some, someone uh, waiting for visitors. And so uh, we, we cannot have uh, old computers working uh, all the time. So that's the problem. That's, that's why we have uh, old computers behind glass. Mm. Sorry about that. But uh, we have also this uh, association. So we have uh, a group of... Um, uh, fans of all computers, and this association um, is very active. And we we organize uh, often um, events in the museum, and during these events, we always have uh, working computers, demos uh, or video games or um, uh, yeah, hmm. this stuff. It's a difficult <laughs> thing to to you know um, to to balance with that because on one level. You know, it, the the whole function of a computer really is to be used, and and it's yeah, difficult to to you know really get an appreciation for it without you know being able to touch it and play with it and 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 see what it does. On the other hand, you know, the more people who've got their grubby hands all over it, the more it's going to break over time, and it's it's like this balance between between preserving it and also you know using it for what it was intended for. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> so you. Uh, so what kind of what what sort of computers do you have? I, I saw that there is a uh, there's some Commodore stuff in there, and there's some some older Apple stuff. And I read somewhere, and I'm not sure where that that is anymore because I don't have it in front of me. But that there was a, a bit of a focus on specific uh, like the Swiss computing history, and that's something we don't know very much about because we hear a lot about you know the the British, you know, history with the, the ZX or, you know, American with the, the C64 and the Vic and all this. But but Switzerland isn't really something that, you know, I, I don't think we have too much um, exposure to what the specific kind of history is there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we have a computing history, yeah. <laughs> and um, the, the comp yes, we have to start. Uh, one interesting thing is the development of the mouse. Uh, because, yes, the invention was, of course, uh, by uh, Douglas Engelbart. But uh, in Switzerland, um, in the 70s, there was a lot of development about uh, the mouse. And uh, one laboratory um, at EPFL, so where we have the museum, um, was developing a mouse uh, under the direction of uh, Professor Jean-Daniel Nicou with uh, someone very important in the Swiss uh, computing. And um, he, he developed the mouse, he developed uh, new technology for the mouse. 
And um, early 80s, from 81 to um, uh, about 82 or 83, uh, Switzerland was the only uh, country in the world that was selling ma- uh, mice, actually. Really? Yeah, because um, uh, the, this mouse he designed, it, it was for um, another Swiss computer that was developed in Zurich for the other, the other uh, polytechnical school in, in Switzerland. And this mouse, he sent it to Zurich for this computer, but also it was then sold by a company uh, in the French-speaking part of Switzerland. And this mouse that was sold uh, early 80s, 81, 82, uh, was also the first Logitech mouse. Oh. Uh, yes, Logitech was founded in 2000, uh, sorry, in uh, 1981. But it was founded to to write uh, software because Logitech is for logiciel, so software in, in French. But uh, so it was not uh, founded to create mice, <laughs> actually, uh, Logitech. And it's only because they needed a mouse for one of their uh, softwares uh, that they asked this professor at TPFL if he, they could um, sell the, this my, uh, mouse that was uh, developed. And so uh, then they started selling mice at Logitech. And now Logitech is uh, uh, mainly for mice. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of ubiquitous. I got got one right there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I also got a Logitech webcam, so... Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and my mouse, my mouse is... Uh, Logitech. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. I never, I never knew that that um, Switzerland has su- such a big computer history. Yeah, that's totally and, new uh, to me. One, one thing that uh, was interesting too is the development of the the Smacky computer. Uh, Smacky is for smart keyboard. S M A K Y. It, it was developed also during the seventies uh, by the same laboratory uh, at uh, the EPFL. It was a very nice computer, very good, techn- uh, and very good technology. It had uh, already a very nice uh, uh, network uh, standard and also graphical cap- capabilities that were very nice for this time. Yes, the first first Smacky that was sold was the Smacky 6 uh, from 1978. And it already uh, had a graphical interface, but, which was quite nice at this time. Oh. And um, the first Smacky with mouse was uh, already in 1980. It was this uh, famous mouse that was then sold by Logitech. And um, as you mentioned, the EF, um, EPFL, I just read that yes. the Swiss, Swiss Federal it's Institute this. for Technology in Lucien, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. Actually, there are two Swiss federal institutes in uh, in Switzerland, one in Zurich and one in Lausanne. All right. And the museum is the one in Lausanne? Yes. Yes, it is. So the museum is actually in that place where where all this history also started. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> or, or the same, same building in the same uh, school. Wow. That's yes, that's nice. really a special special place there to have a museum. Yeah. Um, so now that wonders me because you started you started um, shouting out in the last days that you actually look for funding. So I wonder yeah. why why do you have a problem to to get this going if that is in such a prominent place. Yes, that, that's a good question, actually. Um, we are in this very nice place at EPFL, but uh, we, are, um, we are not founded by the school. We are independent. We have this foundation, and this foundation has its uh, own uh, budget, <laughs> and we are not founded by EPFL. And so, <clears throat> but the problem is not linked to the school, actually. The school is giving us this space um, with no cost. Uh, so it is very nice. But uh, we also need, of course, the storage for the big collection. You know, we have the tens of tons of material. So we, we need a lot uh, of space to, to have this collection. 
Um, and so we have two uh, storage rooms uh, that are not at, at the school. Uh, one, it is okay, it is founded, and the bigger one, uh, who is about, uh, I would say, 70% of the collection, um, is giving uh, uh, is given uh, to us by a, a company in Lausanne, and um, it, it is free since uh, 2001. So thanks thanks to that to them, we have this big collection. But uh, two or three years ago, they said that. Uh, uh, they couldn't pay for it anymore. And so we had to find a way to uh, either uh, move the collection or to pay the rent of this storage. So we started actually one project to have a more professional uh, computer museum, maybe to have a place that is bigger than the one we have at EPFL, and to have a storage at the same place, etc. But this takes a lot of time to build a new museum, you can imagine, oh, to have a, a large place uh, and everything, and to find sponsors. It, it takes very a, a lot of time. And so, in order to have this time to build this museum, we need the money for the rent. So we would like to stay here to, to have uh, the money for at least five years, to be okay and to know that we we can focus on the other project that is the to have a more f- professional museum and mm. to have maybe one salary and uh, everything so it's kind of to buy time to find a better location okay. yes yes that's it that's it yeah yeah i guess i guess that makes sense if 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 third if 70 percent is in storage room because the location isn't big enough, then you could should find a bigger location. And um, I also read in your announcement um, that the problem is you you don't you don't well you don't get entrance money or anything for the museum because it's at the school place, I guess. So you also don't have any incomes from visitors that are yes, that, that's visiting. right. That's right. So that's why also we, for the, the big projects, you know, the one that is longer than the small, uh, just finding money that we have now, um, <clears throat> for this big project, we, we think that the, the best way would be to have our own place, maybe outside EPFL. Uh, it's good to be there, as you said, it's the right place to be, but they have no more place for us. We, we have this, this location, but we cannot expand at all they don't have uh, room for storage and this is and there is this problem with uh, the uh, the income that we cannot ask anything from the visitors they can come and visit and that's it so, so the, the yeah. perfect solution would probably be having still this prominent location but also a location that is nearby in walking distance Yes, that, yes, yes, no, why not, yeah, good idea. <laughs> that whispers can just cross the street and and look at the other part of the museum. Of course, that is that is a bit, a bit unlikely, maybe, because, uh, but that, I guess, would be perfect, you know, if you're yes. just nearby, then you would have the best of both worlds. Yeah, um, that's right, yeah, we, we could imagine have two, two locations, why not, yeah. You know, Um so, so let's start a bit talking about more about the loca- um, about the collection. How, how did it actually start? I guess the biggest problem for museum is probably that nowadays a lot of rare stuff is pretty expensive. I mean, you cannot find an, an, an Apple II at 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 a garbage uh, place somewhere anymore. I mean, well, if, yes, if you I look can. At e- of, uh, <laughs> if you are lucky, but but some stuff like a golden C64 or something you well, you couldn't get yeah. below thirty thousand euros. Yes. So um, I guess that's also a problem, isn't it? Or or is it like people throw the stuff at you and say, okay, here, take it? <laughs> how, how does that actually uh, work? Yes, it, it changed quite a lot. So that's right. Uh, when I started in the 90s, it was not easy to find, but uh, people were not uh, so interested in uh, old stuff, in old computers. And now uh, now we have these stories about Apple Ones, etc., etc. And so people start to think, oh, maybe this, this is interesting. Oh, maybe this is, this is worth something. Um, 
but also uh, because of our visibility, because uh, uh, at least locally we are quite known now to uh, to have this museum since uh, 2002, so people know about the museum. And so uh, uh, we still have a lot of uh, offers for uh, for uh, donations, and we we have to to be quite selective, actually. And uh, we we cannot accept everything because we already have problem with storage, you know. Uh, but uh, yes, of course, if they say, okay, this is uh, some kind of uh, you know our golden computer, uh, golden uh, C64, and all that, we will say yes, of course. But um, <laughs> or Apple One, uh, we will say yes. But uh, <laughs> but we 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 start to be a bit selective. Uh, for instance, if it is. From the 90s, and we we have like uh, three or four times the same computer. Uh, maybe we won't accept it, but we we still accept quite much of these donations because it's not only when it is rare that is interesting for us. It's also uh, when we can use this computer for demos. For instance, uh, we will always accept a C64, uh, even if we have uh, tens of them. Because uh, we we use it for demos for these events I was talking before. Well, I'm just thinking about it. If 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 you don't get the money together, you would have to well, you know, sell a part of it, and that would be pretty sad. Because I think that um, if I want stuff preserved, it should be in hands of museums, because you don't know what's happening to the stuff in private for private people. Yeah. You know, you don't know what. What's what happens if somebody who owns a um, who owns a big collection maybe dies or has an accident, and then mm -hmm. you know you never know what what the family is doing with that stuff. You or know, not, not even maybe that, but but I mean, you could look at things like um, in the early two thousands when they had those whole operations of just taking C sixty fours and yanking the SIDS out and just throwing out the whole the rest of the machine. You know, just completely mm -hmm. destroying it just for the one chip that they could put in something else. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, so yeah, if if it's working and it's, you know, and it's a it's a decent machine, it it, it sucks to have it not be in the hands of someone that's going to preserve it. And you know, uh, this collection, uh, I would say, ninety eight percent is donations. We don't buy things at all because we have so many uh, donations. Uh, we cannot accept everything, so we don't buy. And uh, I was, uh, one example is when I was collecting, I wanted to have a ZX80, which is quite rare. And um, uh, as one possibility was to have to, to go to eBay and to buy one ZX80. And uh, I waited, and I think I waited like 10 years, and then someone gave us a ZX80. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it comes like that. And... Uh, uh, we don't have, we don't want to uh, to buy the the complete collection and to have everything in the collection. We want to use it and we want to display it and to to tell the story to the to the public. So do you also um, do you also put some effort into repairing stuff if it's broken? Yes, yes. For we have uh, a list of um, demos that are always working, and uh, in the association we have uh, all the competencies to to uh, uh, repair and to to make them work. Oh, great! So you are not just putting it in your storage, but you also make sure that the stuff works. Um, not all, because we have too many things to <laughs> to mm -hmm. test. But uh, the, 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 we have uh, about, I would say, 40 maybe demos that are ready and working, ready for events. And what's what's the uh, the cutoff for for what you what you want to keep and preserve? You know, is there like a, you know, we won't bother with anything after 1995 because then that just kind of gets generic PC and Mac and whatnot, or is there or is it everything through? through the current time no no it's not everything i, I would say uh yes 95 is a good uh, good date but also uh, we are looking for more modern stuff because uh, when they are interesting like uh, i know that uh, we will have an ipad one day or we will have uh, the first iphone we have we have the first iphone we found one uh, uh, recently um but 
it's because it's quite interesting to have this piece of uh, hardware because it it was some milestone, you know, first iPhone, of course. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, yes, um, for the PCs, for um, the the common stuff, yes, ninety five is a good uh, cut of date, yeah. Okay. And we're, we're but trying- we are more. Uh, more interested in the 80s and 70s and 60s, of course. <laughs> right, right. What is the oldest thing that you have there? The most, or, or the rarest, I guess, would be the... Rarest or oldest? Uh, I don't think it's the same. <laughs> the <laughs> oldest would be... Uh, uh, we have um, uh, punch machines uh, for from the 40s, I guess, before the computers uh, from IBM. So I would say this is the oldest, but for the computers, we have um, HP 2116, uh, which is very, very rare, I guess, uh, from the 1968. Okay. Also a, a very large IBM, a S- System 3 from 1970, which is, yeah, big yeah. computers. <laughs> and uh, yes, a couple uh, minis. But we don't have a, a straight PDP-8. I would love to have a straight PDP-8. But uh, that was a rare. <laughs> so, yeah, this is the oldest. And the rarest, um, of course, all the Swiss computers are, are very rare, so, of course, because there, there were only, uh, I guess, 4,000 of them built. So it's a very small production. But, yeah, pretty, pretty much... Uh, not rare, but you know, uh, pretty rare stuff. Like uh, yes, the the, um, the Mac 20th anniversary. Uh, oh God. Uh, Eliza. Yeah. <laughs> we have four Elizas, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Olivetti P uh, P101. You know the this uh, old uh, calculator. In size, Altair. Altair. And you're trying to raise, you're trying to uh, put together two hundred thousand uh, Swiss francs, which is yeah, which is about two hundred and five thousand dollars for American listeners. Yes. <laughs> and uh, and and we're, you're trying and 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 forty thousand of those uh, needs to be in by June thirtieth. Yes, because we we have to start uh, paying the rent in September of this year, so we need to have enough money for the one year at least and we are talking a lot about the computers do you also um, cover video game consoles and such stuff yes we do yes um, actually the collection is more focused on computers read computers but of course we have also um, uh, consoles and uh, calculators and uh, uh, stuff that is not directly computers um, even it is more focused on computers. But we have, oh yes, I don't know, uh, 100 uh, video com- game consoles, something like that. And uh, same thing for calculators, old calculators, mechani- mechanical calculators, etc. And of course, NS- yeah. I said you've got uh, a dandy. Said- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, have, have you got a dandy, which is a Russian NES clone? That's a good question. No, actually. no, we don't have a dandy. Oh man, you're hook the, hook, hook the man up. I won't donate mine. No, I'm sorry. It was it was hard to get. Oh my god, it yes. took me three months to to um to, and uh, I asked a friend in Russia, and it took him three months to get one that was in working condition. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> but he, here here. Uh, the NES Classic Mini is a good con- candidate. That was already mm-hmm. rare be- be- before it was actually on the shelves because Nintendo didn't produce enough. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> and uh, one thing I was thinking yeah. of, uh, we're talking of rare machines. Uh, we actually have a connection machine, a thinking machine, connection machine, oh. which is, you know about the connection machines? I don't. So have Very a, vaguely. But, Yes, this is. Uh, it was a, um, a massively parallel uh, computer. Uh, the one we have has uh, 8K processors, and uh, it's one processor in a, is a one-bit processor. <laughs> yeah. 
So we have one uh, 8K of one bit processors, and it's it's very nice because it's like a, a big uh, black cube. Before before the 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 the, the cubes we know, <laughs> you know, Next and uh, and um, Apple Cube, etc. And so it's it's a very nice machine. It was very interesting. Um, the architecture is very interesting, and it's very rare. I saw one at the Computer History Museum, uh, Mountain View, but yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Cool. So let me ask you, what was actually the moment where you said, okay, I want to make a muse museum that covers my name? I mean, that must be special. I mean, <laughs> I have, I've never met somebody who, who has his own museum. So you are the first. Okay. So, uh, how it, um, so it was my personal collection uh, until um, uh, 2009 when I, I gave my collection to the foundation that was uh, founded in 2007. Uh, so it was my personal collection and uh, I gave it uh, my name because it was my collection, you know. And the first name was Bolo's Computer Museum, but it was not a museum, it was a collection. So I started with the name museum. I don't know why, because it sounded better or something. It was Bolo's Computer Museum. And then when I um, uh, I met um, the, 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 the professor at APFL that has the laboratory that is close to the space we have now, and he told us, oh, this, this location would be perfect for a museum with your collection because he heard about the collection. And when we started uh, thinking about what to put in this location uh, as a museum, we said, oh, what name, etc. And because the name was already, uh, the name of the collection was already Bolo's Computer Museum, the, the, the professor told me, oh, it should be Musee Bolo, it should be Bolo Museum, <laughs> because it was my personal collection. So uh, it started like that. And then we... We thought uh, several times maybe we could change the name because Bolo is not about uh, computers, it's about uh, pasta. <laughs> <laughs> Bolognese, you mean? <laughs> and so, okay. and so we, we thought maybe we could change the name. Also because, uh, you know, the, 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 the term museum is always uh, a bit connoted to uh, old stuff and... Uh, um, uh, dusty stuff, you know, because museum is old, etc. So we we thought maybe we could change this name, and it it never happened um, because we have other stuff to do that uh, just change the name of the museum. Uh, we had plenty of stuff to do, and also because this name was getting a bit known locally, and we would do, we didn't want to change it uh, because yeah, it was. The name of this museum that's it but oh, yeah. yeah oh yeah you are quite you're quite all over the place you even have your own english entry in wikipedia so yes. you are pretty easy <laughs> to find on the internet you know it's, it's yeah. true so by, changing by the name would be would be not so easy i would say yeah yeah why, why change it now it would hurt you more than give you a benefit um plus it's unique you know it's it's you know other than just saying the you know the computer museum of you know wherever it's, it's it, there's there's a hundred of them this one at least it's it's something where you can you know it's yes. it's it's got that recognition it's the the bolo museum yeah yeah it's like like the arcade museum that we have here in germany it's called for movement only so to have a unique name is something good i think <laughs> yeah um so let me ask you did did you ever think that this collection and this museum thing would grow so big as a project for you? <laughs> no, never. <laughs> uh, I started like, uh, you know, uh, pi piling stuff in my apartment as a student. And I uh, had this, this first computer for the collection was this Apple II. I found it in the street. And then I found uh, C64 and stuff. And I had then 10 computers in my apartment. And then uh, I met um, the girl who is now my wife. And uh, when I met her, uh, I had nine computers in my collection. And now uh, this collection is about, I would say, maybe two or 3,000 computers. 
And so, so it's, it's grew, it grew, it grew a lot. And, um, uh, I, I didn't know it was going that way, but I was a big collector of other stuff too. I had a, a collection of, uh, beer bottles and, uh, other stuff, stamps, of course. <laughs> and so, um, it started like piling computers and then, uh, um, uh, I started to discover this history, uh, this very rich history. I didn't know about that uh, uh, at all. And so I started to think, oh, maybe it's more that, than a collection. It's uh, there's a story to tell. And so it's, um, it's cool like that. And then um, <clears throat> this association was, um, was created with friends. And so more people were interested. And so I said, oh, maybe there's something to do, like, <laughs> to do, and to, to, to share with people and to share with other fans and to, uh, uh, to, to tell the story to, to, to visitors. I don't know how the situation is in Switzerland, but since two years here in Germany, video games are uh, considered part of culture. So actually the German government and the European Union is actually putting money into preserving video games and old computers and old video game consoles and so on. Are they really? Um, yeah. Well, I should go to Germany. <laughs> yeah, because that is really a thing here since two years. Um, I was actually part of, of an exhibit two years ago that was called Film and Games, where they would like have video games that turned into into movies and the other way around. And um, actually, I heard a speech of the um, minister, European minister of culture of movies and video games. So... <laughs> I don't I don't know I don't know if it would be feasible for you to move the whole connection um from from Switzerland to Germany but <laughs> I I guess preserving stuff here well, is a said, bit easier. Well you said you said there was the, the European Union, the... right? The, and, and Switzerland is part of the European Union. Yeah, yeah I guess. Yeah, I don't so. know. Oh, no 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 we are, not, we are not part of the European Union. What? We are not. Oh that, man. That, that, there's a hole there's a hole in the European Union. Oh. It's called uh, Called Switzerland. <laughs> oh man! You, no, no, you're not part of the European Union, but you are a part of the European con continent. That's the yes. difference. Well, yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. And you have <laughs> some kind of, um, how you would say, um, economy, economy deal with the European Union. It's okay, you can you can import yeah. export stuff cheaper than other countries, mm -hmm. um, but yes, you are not part of the European Union. Today's yeah. to today's political lesson. Brought to you by the <laughs> yeah, Bolo <right>. Museum. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes. I, at least, at least, this is the situation over here. So, it it became a lot easier to actually gather money to preserve collections. So, isn't there something like that in Switzerland where you can, you know, request some funding help from the city or the state you're or talking whatever? About, you're talking about requesting a grant. Yeah, I mean, I mean, something to to avoid that you have to sell part of your collection, which would be pretty sad. Yes, I know. Uh, actually, we um, uh, when we had this information that we had to uh, find a solution for this storage, like two or three years ago, uh, this company told us we have to find a new solution. Uh, we started to, uh, to to have contacts everywhere. Uh, the city of Lausanne in the um, canton, so the, the state, um, <clears throat> and also to the, the the whole country, also the you know, country of Switzerland, we, we asked also had contacts there. Uh, it's not easy, it's not easy because they, um, I, I'm not sure they understand that it's, it is really an heritage and something important to preserve. And also, uh, to, um, uh, we have a lot, a lot of museums in Switzerland. I think we have the highest rate of museum per habitant. Uh, per uh, inhabitant. It's it's crazy. We have uh, something like one thousand uh, museums okay. or something. It's crazy. Know that. Mm. And also, also in Lausanne, they have uh, more than twenty museums. 
And so if they have to, to give money to every museum in Lausanne, it's, it's just not possible. That's why what they uh, answered to us. And um, also, I think that Switzerland, uh, it's not like uh, in the Silicon Valley and you can uh, uh, start a new uh, company and everything is, you know, uh, we don't... Um, but Swiss, Swiss people don't like to take risks. And that's what I feel. And um, this is a little risk to create a new museum and to something, um, a museum for something like a digital culture or digital history. Uh, it's something quite new around here. And so it feels for them maybe to, to be a risk. And um, uh, it's not in the Swiss culture to take risks. <laughs> mm. Well, I mean, the big problem is the more you delay collecting such um, computer trash, as some people call it, <laughs> um, <laughs> the more you, you risk that things are forever lost. Yes, of course. For, I know for, example, for example, arcade machines that <laughs> in the early 70s, 80s, that had suicidal batteries that would leak and destroy the <laughs> ships on it. So Varda. the so person actually um, who who operated the machines actually had to buy a new machine, and I, I think that's kind of sad because some some games some arcade machines are are already lost because of those suicidal batteries, and the ROM data isn't available anymore, you know, yeah. Yeah. and and the same would happen with with rare computers in in a way if there's no working unit anymore it cannot be preserved anymore and you know yeah. that's pretty ah, yes i know i know about that yeah, <laughs> yeah. but i think that you and me uh, think the same but uh, <laughs> we have to convince everybody <laughs> well i mean you're talking about you know it, it, in the swiss culture it's not necessarily big on taking risks but i mean this is this kind of goes beyond it and and the location of the museum which is in uh lausanne i don't know if i'm saying that right but yes, I mean, yes. okay i mean mm -hmm. that's that's you know you're you're right near france you're you're within driving distance of italy and and in mm -hmm. germany if you've got a day trip i mean you could make it down there i mean it's not it's not like you're far away from you know this benefits other people within the general area you know you can go there if you're in germany you could you could go to this museum easily yeah, I can yes. take a train and yeah, and um, and travel to Switzerland in a few hours. Yeah, right, I can exactly. do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I think it really impacts people outside of the the general area, you know, because it's it's accessible to to pretty much everybody in Europe. Mm -hmm. Of course, mm -hmm. I mean you can you can even take um, a short trip with the plane from uk and mm -hmm. you can go to switzerland and just visit the museum right. so i think it's aj is right it's benefiting everybody in europe who wants to see um a museum a collection that's actually placed at that location where um S swiss computer history started and i think that's a special thing here yeah yeah, yeah. that's right so you also have, aside from just the machines themselves, you have documentation on the machines, and you have, you've got per, you know uh, peripheral devices, things that are not necessarily the vintage machines themselves, but also stuff that went with them. Exactly. Yes, uh, yes, yes. We have uh, so we have the computers, the video cons video game consoles, uh, my calculators, but also yes, peripherals, so the printers, the joysticks, etc. And of course, the software. Uh, we have a lot of software. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, we were lucky to, to meet uh, Bruno Bonnel. Maybe you know him. Bruno Bonnel is a uh, founder of uh, Infogram in France. Mm -hmm. And uh, Infogram was yeah, editing a lot of uh, video games in the 80s, 90s. And uh, uh, this guy uh, decided to give his uh, collection to the Bolo Museum. And uh, this collection is about two to three thousand uh, video games from Infogram, uh, all sealed, shrink wrapped, uh, new. So it's very, it's a very nice collection. We are now uh, doing the inventory of this collection. Okay, and and there's there's books and magazines and everything related to this as yes, well. Yes, books yeah? and magazines. Yes, as well. 
so yeah, so Byte and uh, all the all these magazines and the books and yeah. So so it's really kind of all encompassing, right? You know, you're not. You, it's not just an issue of oh, we'll come here and look at the old computers. And it, it's here's the whole culture that goes along with it. Everything that sort of yes. had anything to do that's with this idea. stuff is here. That's that's the idea, and we would love to have. Um, we started, but we don't have enough time because we are all you know volunteers. Uh, we started also to meet people. We would like to interview people. Uh, for instance, we interviewed the um, the guy who designed the first uh, computer that was sold in Switzerland, which is uh, so. It was not the first microcomputer who was the smack key, but the first computer who was uh, built in early 60s in Zurich. So not in Lausanne, in Zurich. And this computer was built for the the Swiss army. And that was quite interesting because when we started to think about the new exhibit in 2011, um, early 2011, I found this machine uh, in a basement at EPFL. At the school, and this machine, I did not know what it was. It, it looked like a big uh, uh, freezer or something. <laughs> uh, I, I, it it was old, of course. It, it was it was old, but I thought it was some laboratory stuff and not a computer. And I opened it, and it looked like computer stuff. So I started to uh, investigate, and I, I sent tons of mails. Uh, because I found a name on it. It was written Contraverse Cora 1. Contraverse was the company that was built this machine. And so um, after investigating like several months, I found out that this machine was the first computer that was sold in Switzerland. And they built about 60 of them. And it's a very nice and heavy machine also. <laughs> because it was, you know, and the first one was... Uh, uh, sold in 63 or something or 64 and the guy i was telling that because uh, i was saying that we want to interview people and the guy who um who designed it um, at the end of the 50s and uh, early 60s uh, he's um, a guy coming from hungary who came to switzerland uh, at the end of the 50s he moved to zurich and he was uh, a very young guy at this time, and uh, he was hired by this company, Contraverse, who was a company that was building computers, but um, analogical computers and not uh, digital computers. And these computers were to to uh, uh, get the data from radars and to send it to cannons to um, uh, destroy uh, airplanes. Hmm. And this guy came at the end of the 50s, and he said to his boss, he was quite young, but he said to his boss, um, the future is not analogical, the future is digital. He, was, he had this idea at the end of the 50s, which was, wow, nice. And, um, and, and his boss said, okay, go for it, go digital. And he designed the first Swiss computer that was sold. Wow. Wow. <laughs> And the interesting story is that um, uh, it was uh, an army computer, so it was uh, uh, secret, and that's why uh, nobody knew about this computer. So when we we found it and we investigate about it in 2011, so it, it was quite an interesting thing to 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 find because it was like secret for more than 40 years. Huh. Wow. <laughs> And, and you discovered it. Yes, I did. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's that's amazing. That's amazing. And it, it must feel amazing to interview this guy finally. Yes. And, he, you know, uh, we interviewed it uh, uh, a bit officially, etc. But we also have a video of him finding the computer in the basement at EPFL. And we opened the door and he see this machine that he didn't see for like 40 years. <laughs> it was something crazy. And I, we have wow. the video of that. Maybe, maybe we will release it during the campaign, you know, as a, as a, gift, to, as a gift to donors. <laughs> yes, that was just my next question. Can, you, can anybody <laughs> see it anywhere? Because that, that would be interesting to see. Also, also see the interview if you recorded it. Uh, yes. That, that, 
that was I, also what I just have to ask him if he's okay about that but if he's okay i think we will release it during the campaign you know to to go again uh, uh, and to say we are still here find, uh, trying to find money and here is a gift for you <laughs> yeah I, i guess i guess it's it's interesting when people actually can see what was done in your museum like discovering um, a rare computer one of the first if not the first ever made in Switzerland, and also an interview with the creator. I mean, people like to see stuff, not only hear yes. about it, but really see it with their own eyes, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, that's always interesting for me. And, and this is also why, why we are doing those interviews with people on video, you know? Um, It's, it's also it's also surprising people sometimes when I tell them, oh, okay, okay, this person is like 87, and and mostly they ask me, do they know do they know how to use Skype and, and the computer? And I'm like, well, th those people invented the stuff. Of course they know how to use modern <laughs> computers. You know, no question, no question about it. You know, if you if you are an inventor in the computer area then you know how modern stuff works, of course, you know, That's just awesome. like another application to use, you know. Um, so yeah. that, that's great. Um, so anything else that you did with the museum, despite that one interview and the events that you mentioned? Yes, maybe one thing that the association did was quite interesting. Uh, to to show that we also can give service and not only uh, uh, do events but uh, offer service to to people. For instance, the you know that in Geneva there is the CERN Center for uh, Nuclear Research, mm -hmm. and um, you know that's where the web was invented by Tim Berners Lee. Mm -hmm. So World Wide Web was invented there, and uh, they have the um, uh, Tim Berners Lee's. Uh, Uh, next cube when he invented the World Wide Web. So the, the original machine is there at the CERN and they keep it very, you know, secretly in, a, in like a, <laughs> a bunker or something. And um, <clears throat> one problem was that uh, they wanted to, uh, to have a copy of the hard disk of this machine and uh, they didn't have the competencies for that. And so the association of the, the Friends of the Bolo Museum went there, and they they had to dismantle this next cube and extract the the hard drive, and they made a copy. And one then we don't have the copy, but one copy is at the CERN, and we send we send one copy to Tim Berners Lee, and so that was quite an achievement because uh, yeah this uh, historic machine uh, it's quite difficult to approach. And uh, it, to to be able to open it and to uh, extract the data, that does something. Yeah, that's actually something that we often mention in this podcast when we interview people. That people tell us that knowledge is being lost. People nowadays, you know, youngsters, they they don't know about this stuff. They never learned mm -hmm. how to you how to dismantle a computer and how to preserve data from an old hard disk if they even know what a hard disk is or uh, a diskette, you know. Mm -hmm. Most younger people just remember it as a safe icon, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the only thing they saw was CDs, you know, but they never mm -hmm. saw a diskette before. So that's also a problem. People get older and maybe the knowledge is getting lost in a way. So, mm -hmm. and um, I also think this is interesting that you also keep the documents and magazines and so on, because most computer museums, they concentrate on one thing, you know, mm -hmm. and yes. you kind of try to preserve everything. You could, you could say it's kind of the Swiss army knife of computer museums. <laughs> yes. Swiss army. I'm not, yes, I'm not going to make any more jokes after that one. <laughs> <laughs> That that uh, could be your campaign slogan. Yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Some yeah. kind of copyright. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's fine. You can have it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, where can people it, go to 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 learn yeah. more about this and and to and to donate if they want to? 
Yes, so we have we have this site go.bolo.ch go below the th uh, which is the main site for uh, this campaign and we have explained all the problems we have and this site is currently in french with uh, just uh, a press release that is uh, uh, translated in english but we are working on an english version and we we still have uh, technical problems but we have the translation already Ready in a Google Doc, but uh, we we need to to um, fix a technical problem to have two languages for this site. Okay. But it will be up soon, I guess. Okay. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, maybe even when we release this next week, maybe it will be up then. We will yeah. see. Yeah, yeah, and and if not, just you know, go on Chrome, go there. It'll do auto translation. It's cool. It work. <laughs> yeah, it exactly. works because I looked at it before. <laughs> yeah of course of course it's easier if you can just um watch the page in the language you are used to hmm. yeah which is the There's first thing point. i mentioned to you i said like well french is pretty much <laughs> useless for internet international campaign you know <laughs> i know i know i know i know but you know we had we had priori priorities and it was quite a long work to prepare this campaign and so we are, you know, fixing stuff uh, one after another, and this is something we are going to do to translate this page. You actually never intended to go international with this campaign, I guess. Um, that was not the first idea, yes, because we thought that um, we were known in a lo more locally, uh, but uh, it turns out that uh, international. Uh, fans of her old computers uh, were um, and knew about the Bolo Museum, which is quite good and uh, quite uh, not surprising as like, uh, totally, but, uh, but yes, that uh, they are interested in keeping this uh, museum alive. Uh, this is very nice. And, uh, but it was something that we, we were not sure about. And we, we, th we thought maybe we, we have to focus to uh, local uh, donors. Mm. And um, and that and then yes, it turns out that everyone wants to save the museum. So thank you to everyone, and uh, <laughs> we will translate the site. <laughs> well, I mean, what what I learned today is I never knew this that Switzerland had such a big part in in the invention of computer and ma ma mice, as you said, and um, army computers. That's really new new to me that I learned today. So. Mm -hmm. And you have some uh, some interesting uh, some some cool uh, benefits and uh, rewards for people that actually do donate. Yes, we we um, we, we have a list of uh, of benefits, but uh, yeah, it's it's simple stuff. It's not uh, like a Kickstarter when you can buy a T-shirt at uh, twenty five dollars. Mm -hmm. Here, it's the goal is to to have money to save the collections and not to sell. Uh, mugs or sell uh, t-shirts right. so the first goal is to save the collections but we have a list of benefits and um, uh, if you have uh, uh, twenty thousand uh, dollars for us then you, you will have um, a clone a copy of an apple one a working copy of an apple one because that was a project that we had uh, uh, at the association was to to build a, a functional copy uh, of an apple one and so we can build for one for you <laughs> so if okay. you if you have to decide whether you buy a new car or support the museum, support the museum yes. and drive your hey, car yes. another ten years. Y y you know, <laughs> with the prices of what an actual Apple One would be, that's probably pretty reasonable. I would I would think. Yes, yes, of course, and it's functional. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. And we will put links to all of this in the podcast description so that people can go there and and then they can donate and they can read about what you're doing and see the the pictures which. Some of the images that I see from the from the different exhibits you have, I mean, it's really it looks like a really cool place to go to and check out. Definitely if something. Happen, if you happen to come to to Lausanne, just uh, give yeah. me a call. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ajay, point that in, put that I'll, into a European I'll, trip. Yes, I'll put that on my <laughs> my my world tour. Right after Gamescom, you you take mm -hmm. a, you take a train from Cologne to to Lausanne. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> 
Excellent. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Right. Great. Well, yeah. so, so thanks for taking the time and telling us your history of the museum. Thank you. Thanks to you. And to, uh, to, it was very nice meeting you. Yes. Meeting you too. You as well. So that was Yves Bolognini from the Bolo Museum in Lausanne, Switzerland. Um, if you want to check that out and, and donate and, and see what they're doing, you can go to go.bolo.ch. That's go.bolo.ch. And we talked about there being an English uh, version of the site. And since we've recorded this, there is now an English version of the site. So if you go on there, you can see it in a language other than French. Um, if you also want to look at the main site of the of the museum, it's www.bolo.ch. And again, we'll put links to all of this in the description below. So if you want to know about anything that we talked about tonight, that's where to look for it. Us, you, you know where to find us. You're listening to us now, so obviously you found us somewhere. Um, so yeah, until next time, see ya.